Welcome to Savage Marriage. This is Phil Fretwell, and in this podcast, Priscilla and I will be reading chapter one in our upcoming book. Thanks for joining us. Savage Marriage, Facing the Intense Pain of Betrayal to Find the Incredible Power of Forgiveness. As read by the authors, Phil and Priscilla Fretwell. Chapter One, Two Crooked Sticks. This people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Matthew 15, 8. Wearing a mask wears you out. Faking it is fatiguing. The most exhausting activity is pretending to be what you know you aren't. Rick Warren. Hello? Hi, this is 16,000 Movies calling about some videos that were rented this past weekend. It looks like they weren't returned. What videos? I didn't rent any videos. I had been out of town with some girlfriends. The clerk quickly rattled off some strange, unfamiliar titles. I was a movie buff and read People magazine cover to cover, but I didn't recognize any of these movies. I've never heard of them. What are they rated? The clerk replied bluntly, they're triple X for adults only. I paused. I knew we had an account at 16,000 movies, but I didn't like going there because the adult section wasn't completely closed off and it was hard to keep track of my kids as they wandered through the store, eagerly picking up movies and begging to rent them. We don't rent those kind of movies, I replied curtly embarrassed that someone had our name and number associated with a list of people watching X-rated videos. After all, we're good churchgoers and certainly didn't watch filth like this. Well, ma'am, we have a camera that records everyone who rents videos. If you'd like to come to our store, we can show you the footage and figure out who's renting on your account. This has to be a mistake. Phil and I had been married for 10 years, and I trusted him completely. No, that's okay. I'll call my husband. I never suspected Phil could be watching porn. For the first four years of our marriage, we didn't even have a television. Phil's going to say, no, I didn't rent any videos, and I'll call the store and tell him their system is messed up. I didn't rent the videos, and Phil didn't either. I quickly dialed Phil's number. Hey, it's me. I got a call from 16,000 Movies. They said two movies were not returned from last weekend. Did you rent any movies? Her simple question sent me reeling, and images from the previous weekend flooded my mind. My breathing was rapid and shallow as my thoughts swirled, momentarily disabling my usual calm and logical thinking. I wanted to run and hide. The weekend Priscilla spent away with some girlfriends, I stayed home with our three children, ages eight, seven, and five. That Friday after work, I stopped by 16,000 movies because I knew it had an adults-only section, unlike the video store we usually frequented. I had struggled with viewing porn and masturbation since I was 10, but I'd never shared this with Priscilla. It was a constant noose around my neck, something I'd learned to live with, reasoning that all men dealt with a normal level of lust. I had occasionally gone inside adult video stores and gazed at the covers, wanting to see more, but had never been brave enough to buy anything. It was too risky. With Priscilla out of town, it was a perfect opportunity to indulge myself. I strolled back and forth in the adult section, eventually picking two tempting titles and sheepishly carrying them to the checkout counter. Did you find everything okay? The clerk asked without looking at me. Yes, I stammered, wondering if her question was some kind of humiliating joke she liked to play on men who rented adult videos. Hurry up, lady. I just want to get out of here. The thought of someone seeing me with those videos made me nervous. I was well known in the community and a leader in my church. I couldn't imagine explaining the videos to anyone. I was accustomed to watching porn in the solitude of hotel rooms while away on business trips and on the internet, but this was the first time I'd risked bringing porn videos into our home. Leaving the store, I breathed a bit easier, got into my car, and turned toward home. No one will ever know. Priscilla's out of town, and after the kids go to bed, I can immerse myself in the videos. 
it won't hurt anybody. On Sunday night, I'd made a point to return the videos to the After Hours Dropbox so I wouldn't have to see anyone. As I slid the videos through the slot, I wondered, what happens if a clerk doesn't check in these videos correctly? Thinking about someone calling our house caused a sudden pang of fear. Then I reasoned that such a scenario couldn't happen often. They must have strong procedures in place for checking in videos, certainly adult videos. They wouldn't risk talking with somebody's wife about unreturned X-rated videos. Phil, are you there? Priscilla's question cut through my thoughts as her voice ended in a higher pitch. Like a chess game, I was going through all sorts of combinations and permutations of answers, each response creating another path that required more answers. I needed time to think, time to figure out how to feign no knowledge of the videos and fix this problem. I didn't want to hurt Priscilla, but more importantly, I wanted to protect myself. Not knowing how to answer, I managed a week. I'll be home in a few minutes. I'd been caught. My nightmare was beginning. I'd worked for years to keep my porn use secret. Oh, I'd occasionally talked with close friends about it, but it was the kind of discussion many good Christian men have. One guy says something like, I struggled a bit last week with some things on the internet. All the other men nod knowingly, and a few volunteer that they had also. Then everyone agrees to do better next week and asks, what's for lunch? It was a well-worn pattern for my accountability groups that allowed me to process a little guilt while at the same time keep secrets from Priscilla. This time was different for me. I'd been caught and Priscilla wouldn't be so quick to nod knowingly. I knew I needed a better story. The 15 minute drive home gave me time to figure out what I was going to say. My heart was gripped with uncertainty and fear was starting to creep in, kindling my anger. Phil had paused too long. He deflected my question and simply said, he's coming home. My chest felt like it was going to explode and I hoped for an easy explanation, a denial, anything that would have explained a crazy mistake by a video store. But no, he said he was coming home. And my heart was instantly crushed and hurled into the pit of my stomach. Why would he do this? How could he bring porn into our home? My imagination was running wild and stoking the anger. He betrayed me. He's going against every vow he ever made to me. I'm supposed to be the only one in his eyes and life. Then the realization of what had just happened hit me. Our marriage, our perfect marriage, was no longer perfect. It was now blemished, scarred, and tainted. And I was injured and hurting. What I thought was solid ground was really sinking sand. I could feel the foundation of my marriage shifting and crumbling beneath my feet. I slumped onto the chair at the kitchen table, unable to bear the weight of my broken heart. Although I knew that porn was considered mainstream entertainment by many, and that even some Christians watched porn at least occasionally in the privacy of their bedrooms, it wasn't something my Christian upbringing could let slide. I grew up in a conservative Christian home, and my parents were rule followers, missionaries in Brazil for most of my life which set the framework for my thinking. One of their warnings was, hold on to my prized virginity or no one would marry me. So I had been very careful in my dating life, hearing my dad's voice every time a guy started to get a little too close. Some dates got out of hand and went a little too far, and I'd feel dirty, used, unworthy, and racked with shame exactly how I felt now, sitting at our kitchen table, waiting for Phil's arrival and explanation. I felt betrayed, sinned against, and angry. How can this be happening? I've been a good Christian girl, followed all the rules, and married my Jesus-loving knight. Phil was a confident leader and a strong in his faith. He even taught weekly Bible studies. In fact, 
It was attending a Bible study for our church singles group meeting at Phil's place where our dating relationship blossomed. He was a solid Christian. This man knew a lot of scriptures and others looked to him as a well-versed Bible teacher. He didn't even kiss me until we were engaged. And most of all, he regularly professed his commitment to me and his love. After 10 years of marriage to suddenly discover I wasn't desirable enough to keep Phil's attention was a fierce blow to everything I thought I knew about Phil, our marriage, and especially about myself. There must be something wrong with me. Am I not sexy enough? Does my lack of self-confidence in the bed turn him off? What's the matter with me that he turned to porn? I walked in the door and met Priscilla's tense face. Her lips were tight and so were her folded arms. No smile, no warm welcome, and certainly no kiss hello. I'm in a serious predicament. I tried to temper my anxiety. I was usually good at easing a tense situation, but in this case, my heart was beating fast and my words felt stuck in my throat. I joined Priscilla at our familiar kitchen table, which now seemed like a cold judge's bench separating us rather than bringing us together as it had for so many years. Did you rent the movies? Yes, I did. I stared into her eyes, then quickly dropped my gaze in shame. I had always admired Priscilla's regard for purity, so I hid everything from her, thinking she would not be able to handle my porn use. How can I recover without doing more damage? She was silent, waiting, and I glanced up to see her looking at me, searching for truth. Sitting across from me, Phil's eyes were wide, alert and full of regret. His face was completely drained. He was white as a ghost. His eyes were darting around the room like his mind was spinning in search of a plausible answer. Phil always had the answer to every question, his field of expertise as a consultant. He appeared desperate for words to appease my hot anger, anything to avoid a massive blow up. Priscilla was cold and measured on the outside, but I could tell she was a volcano of hot lava getting ready to erupt. Where did you watch them? In the family room after the kids went to bed. In the family room, you brought those videos into our home? What about the kids? Priscilla jumped from her seat and began to pace, throwing her hands into the air as her voice rose with anger and boiled over. They always get up in the middle of the night, wanting water or having a bloody nose. How do you know they didn't see you? My words were dipped in venom, angry as fire and fueled by my disgust. I sat back down and stared intently into Phil's eyes, wanting for his answer or acknowledgement or something to tell me how he was going to make this right, although I was deeply offended that he would do this to me. I was even more upset that he would risk the exposure of porn to our children. I had given my entire life towards our marriage and family all of my time and effort, caring for them and protecting my treasured babies. How could he be so reckless? Priscilla's question was a good one. What if one of our kids had seen me? The truth was I hadn't been thinking much about our children at the time other than getting them quickly to bed. My mind had disengaged as it always did when lust took over. I realized she was right. The kids could have walked in and I would have hurried them back to bed and rationalized that they were too young to understand what they had seen. But the fact was they hadn't walked in or seen anything. I finally responded, trying to diffuse Priscilla's wrath with logic. I waited until I was sure they were asleep. They didn't get up. No one saw anything. I watched with hope for her to breathe a sigh of relief. Instead, her eyebrows scrunched together as her face flushed red. She fired back. Are you kidding me? Just because they didn't see anything doesn't make it okay. Why did you even want to watch that crap? 
I'd never shared with Priscilla anything about my exposure to porn as a child. Maybe I should. Maybe she'll feel sorry for me if she knows the truth and thinks that I'm a victim. She might even show me a little grace. My only question was, how much should I share? In the heat of Priscilla's demanding glare, I decided to pull back the curtain to my childhood just a little. I needed to appear sorrowful and repentant to be convincing. That wouldn't fully be an act. In fact, I was very sorry that I'd been caught. Priscilla, I've, I've had a problem with pornography back from my childhood. I shared with an air of resignation, like I was finally getting her in on a big secret, a big painful secret. When I was 10 or 11, I found some magazines in a neighbor's trash and got hooked on them. But after I became a Christian, I knew it wasn't right, and I threw them all away. When you were away, I just got pulled back into my old temptations. I'm so sorry. I dropped my eyes as my voice trailed off. I hadn't told her the whole story about my porn use, but I hoped she'd sense my despair and I wouldn't need to tell her anymore. After all, she was a very caring wife and mom. I was counting on her nurturing instincts to kick in. Frankly, Phil, I could care less about your childhood porn viewing. I care about my kids. I care about having a good marriage like we had yesterday. These are the things that matter to me. You should have cared about them too and thought about your family and our marriage before you decided to rent those movies. You should have cared about us instead of yourself. Your past should remain in the past. I had seen right through him. I was livid that he thought he could manipulate me into feeling sorry for him. But Phil didn't know I had been exposed to porn as a teen. Down the street from my childhood home in Sacramento, I babysat for a couple with two little kids. And being a snoopy 15-year-old, I looked through all the rooms of their home while their kids napped. In the master bedroom, I discovered porn magazines and books stacked neatly on the bedside table as I sat on the edge of the bed and quietly flipped through the magazines. I knew I wasn't supposed to look at such pictures, but I couldn't put them down. Sex was not talked about in our home, so what I was seeing that my eyes should never have seen was all new to me. Seeing something so private made me feel ashamed and guilty and dirty. Later in my early 20s, my sister and I rented an apartment while going to a Christian college in Florida. We decided to add cable TV, and watching HBO became a norm for us. When our parents visited us from Brazil, my dad asked, What's this smut on your TV? It's cable TV, Dad. I rolled my eyes. You're going to disconnect it right now, he demanded. There was no debating with my dad. We did what he said, even though we were paying for the cable. As time passed, the magazine and the movie images in my head held less hold on me. I remembered only a little of the smutty movies, but the magazine pictures were engraved in my psyche. Although I struggled to forget them, to keep them hidden in the recesses of my mind, they became a source of guilt years later as I thought about them when being intimate with Phil. But I stopped looking at such things years ago, disgusted with the mere thought. So why couldn't Phil stop looking at them? It was that simple. Just say no, right? It worked for me. I didn't understand why this was so hard for him. Although his porn revelation released memories of my own shame, I decided to keep my past to myself. I didn't have a problem staying away from porn. It was Phil's problem that he had created a sudden, unexpected deluge between us. He had done wrong, not me. Mr. Fixit needed to shift into high gear. Minutes passed between us in silence. I had no more questions for him, and apparently he had nothing else to offer me. I was done. All I knew was that he needed to fix this problem he created in our marriage. I stood and snapped, get it fixed, because I will not live like this. Okay, I'll, I'll get it fixed. I'm going to find a good Christian counselor to help me. I hated myself for looking at those videos, Priscilla, and I don't ever want to do it again. I don't care what you have to do. Just get it fixed. 
Everything I said was true. I hated the way I felt after my repeated failures. Priscilla didn't need to know how many failures. One was enough. Further disclosure would just hurt her all the more, and I'd already hurt her enough. A counselor can help me and provide a safe, confidential place for me to get honest. I actually felt relieved. Trying my best to appear contrite and conciliatory, I searched Priscilla's face, still hoping for some sign of mercy and grace. Even though I was fuming, Phil admitting he had a problem was out of character for him, different and unexpected. He always had everything together. You could always ask Phil because he knew everything, Mr. Perfect. Admitting he needed help even though I demanded he fix the problem had taken the razor's edge off my anger and resentment. A good Christian counselor will surely fix his porn issue. That's what counselors do, help people get their lives together. I wanted our life to return to what it had been before, Phil's confession about 16,000 movies. A counselor was certainly someone I could put my trust in to fix his problem. I started to leave the house for school pickup, and Phil took a step toward me, wanting a hug like all was forgiven. I put a stop hand on his chest and shook my head. No, I don't think so. All is not forgiven. All is not well. The last thing I want to do is be that close to you. I stepped around him and left through the kitchen door. In the wake of Priscilla's departure, I slowly began to breathe again. Alone at the kitchen table, I wasted no time searching for a Christian counselor. I recognized Brian's name from the radio. His credentials looked great and included many years of experience. I immediately called and set an appointment for the following week, vague with the receptionist about the real reason for my visit. Brian's website had assured me that everything would remain confidential, which was exactly what I was looking for. I was an elder at church and taught weekly Bible studies. If this got out, it would ruin my reputation and cause needless additional pain for Priscilla. For days after Phil's confession, I spiraled. I didn't have anywhere to turn. I can't tell my friends, especially my church friends. My family? No way. Not them. I knew that God's word could be a source of comfort, but as an adult, I had always been too busy to read the Bible. God knew how full my hands were being a mom of three kids. Besides, my life was going pretty well until the call from 16,000 movies. Also, reading my Bible stirred up resentment towards my dad. When I was in fifth and sixth grade, all I wanted to do was get home and watch my favorite shows but my dad had made me read my Bible every day and write a summary of what I read before I could watch TV. He made reading the Bible a chore rather than a delight. But now, in my distress, I had nowhere else to go. I picked up my Bible. It felt foreign in my hands. With the thumb on the edge, I allowed the pages to feather slowly. The flow stopped with my finger pointing to Psalms 147.3. My eyes scanned the words, and there, in the despair and loneliness and isolation, I saw God. He was there talking to me. Desperate, I put my faith in his word as truth. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. His assurance burst the dam. I built inside me, and the flood of tears streamed down my face. I wept until all of my hurt was released. In the margin of the passage beside the verse I wrote, My heart is broken. When will it be restored? I didn't know it then, but it would take 18 years for my question to be answered. In my first session with Brian, I quickly told him about my porn problem. He nodded knowingly like he'd heard my story a thousand times. So, Phil, it sounds like you're ready to get to business. Brian was straightforward and direct. It felt good to be able to share with trust that no one else would learn about my problems. He provided encouragement and advice on how to control my unwanted behaviors. I developed a good relationship with Brian and learned how to navigate the counseling sessions to appear that I was doing well and have something positive to report to Priscilla without lying if she asked, which she usually didn't. A typical session began with pleasantries, then Brian would turn serious. Phil, part of our meeting is about accountability. 
So how has this week gone for you? Better, I would start, but not perfect. Well, if it had been perfect, you would have been Jesus. We'd both laugh, and I'd feel relieved. I didn't lie and didn't feel like I had to say too much. Sometimes he asked detailed questions about my week, and I would try to answer while minimizing my failures. On days when I felt guilty about a fresh failure, I'd confess with more contriteness, wanting to feel Brian's compassion and assurance of forgiveness. If my failure occurred more than a week prior, I'd typically have read my Bible and prayed enough to feel better about myself before my next counseling meeting, and I'd try to be vague with my answers. Regardless, I always felt better after meeting with Brian, sort of like going to the dentist to get a cavity filled. I'd approach the meeting full of anxiety, but feel great when it was over. My basic issue was that I was not hot with Brian. Honest, open, and transparent. I was simply honest, sparingly. My goal was to answer his questions truthfully without providing embarrassing information I felt was unnecessary to share. When he asked a question, I answered like a lawyer with carefully crafted responses. If I had been truly open, I would have provided details beyond the questions he asked. If I had been truly transparent, I would have provided pertinent information without his prompting questions. The truth is, I was merely honest without being open or transparent. This lawyerly skill of being only honest was something all liars and cheaters learned and I was no different. It would be 18 years before I'd realize I have to be hot to be healed. We didn't talk much about Phil's meetings with Brian. He only would say, I'm going to see Brian today. I was hesitant to ask questions, and occasionally I hinted at a question, and Phil would say, you know, I don't think Brian wants us to talk about it. It's supposed to be confidential. If you're going to ask me after every session what we discussed, I'm probably not going to share much with him out of fear that I'll have to share it with you. With that explanation, I was left in the dark about the details of what was going on between Phil and Brian that would give me insight into Phil's progress. Not knowing the details made me feel disconnected, but I felt I had little choice. I needed to trust that Brian and Phil's new accountability partner were helping him control his temptation. From what I knew, this was how most men's accountability groups worked. Men needed a safe place to share, and I would just have to live with that. For business trips, Phil suggested I look at the hotel receipts as a means of accountability because he didn't want to be tempted to watch movies. I did, but after a few trips, I realized his offering was bogus. He could change receipts with the whiteout or simply pay cash. I wised up and told him, I'm not going to be your Holy Spirit and check these receipts anymore. I'm done with this. He also put filters on the computer and his phone and asked me to examine the reports. An old proverb came to mind, where there's a will, there's a way around everything. I didn't want to be Phil's police, checking to see if he was keeping all the rules. It was all too stressful and overwhelming for me. I told him I was off the police force and he was on his own with his recently acquired accountability partner and Brian. I met with Brian for five years after I was caught renting the porn videos. Even though I continued to struggle with cycles of porn offset by religious good works, I felt I at least understood more about my struggle. With the additional help of computer and phone filters and meetings with Jeff, my accountability partner, the length of time between failures had increased. I broached with Brian the subject of no longer meeting. Brian, do men continue to meet with you for the rest of their lives? Well, honestly, Phil, most men meet until they feel like their sin activity is down to a level they can successfully manage on their own, and then they just stop coming. Well, I think I'm there. I'm not perfect, because if I was, I'd be Jesus. Brian laughed and agreed, but I am doing much better. That's when my professional counseling with Brian ended. Over the 18 years subsequent to Priscilla discovering the porn videos, we convinced ourselves that everything in our marriage was restored, but we were just two crooked sticks 
pretending to be straight. Looking back on what happened when my sin was first exposed, I had no idea God was throwing me a lifeline. He was pursuing me, wanting my attention. Now, as we are writing this book, married over 30 years, Priscilla and I reflected on what we wish we could have communicated to the younger versions of ourselves many years ago. Here's what I wrote. Dear 37-year-old me, God threw you a lifeline 10 years into our marriage, but you were more interested in protecting your image than being healed. Sure, you wanted healing, but you wanted a pain-free healing. You didn't really want to be honest, open, and transparent with anyone, and you manipulated Priscilla into believing you were fixed. Your real goal was to look good and be somebody at work and in church. If you knew that your future was going to get much worse, would you have taken a different course? Your basic issue was pride. Though you knew scripture, you settled for an explanation of God rather than an encounter with him that could have changed your life. You didn't act on the truth that God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. So while you were praying for God to help you in the midst of your arrogance, he was actually resisting you. If you had humbled yourself, your situation would have been so much different, and you would have saved yourself and your family so much pain through the years. Wishing it had been different, 60-year-old me. Dear 36-year-old me, I wish you had a restart button to change the choices you made for so many years. Why did you let fear influence your decisions? Why did you let anger and pride be your guide? You let the million little pieces of the puzzle become overwhelming as you wondered how you piece together a path to healing. Instead of being a solo act, you should have asked God to join you, the one who knows how to solve every puzzle. You should have trusted in him and him alone. You repeated the same mistakes for many years, putting your trust in a man. Growing up, you placed your trust in your dad. When you married, you placed your trust in Phil. And when he failed you, you put your trust in a counselor. You believed your dad, Phil and Brian, would fix all your problems. But real healing only comes from God, and he alone is worthy of our trust. Rather than go through the hard discussions, you wanted everything to go away. You believed you looked good, you were good. You traded real healing for the appearance of a perfect marriage and family. In the process, you lost your soul to anger, fear, and unforgiveness. Pride has a way of doing that. You put yourself in a prison of your own making, and it took you 18 years to find freedom. Hurting for the choices you made, 59-year-old me. I recently opened Priscilla's Bible and saw the verse she'd circled years earlier. I was surprised, realizing for the first time how deeply she must have felt my betrayal. Back then, I was pleased that I had protected her from the worst of who I was and that my actions preserved the image and reputation I designed for myself and my family. I didn't realize that the full impact of my pride and refusal to be hot had not yet been revealed. It was awaiting us further down the road, and the little bit of pain I felt from that weekend of porn was only a drop in the bucket. The hurricane was still 18 years ahead. This has been Phil and Priscilla Fretwell with Savage Marriage. Thanks for joining us as we've read Chapter 1, Two Crooked Sticks, to our upcoming book, Savage Marriage, Facing the Intense Pain of Betrayal to Find the Incredible Power of Forgiveness. Our publication date is expected to be early 2022, and we hope you'll get a copy when it's available. Please follow us at Savage Marriage Ministries on Facebook and Instagram. Thanks for joining us.